everyone. My name is Hillary Sloat, and I'm the principal at Hilliard Horizon Elementary School in Hilliard, Ohio, which is about 10 minutes outside of Columbus on the west side. And last year, I had the opportunity to read Ruby Payne's book, Emotional Poverty, and it really impacted not only me, but the whole staff here at Hilliard Horizon. Um, we just found a lot of the strategies to be powerful and easy to implement. So I'm telling you today about some of our strategies that really, really worked. Um, we've had a lot of success implementing a lot of things and the students have really benefited from it. So the first thing to look at is why do we have emotions? And emotions are very, very normal part of life. We have emotions um, because if we have a need or if we want to stay safe like fear and anxiety come when there's a threat around and we need to stay safe we have anger to protect or draw boundaries around ourselves um, we look at shame and the social acceptance and approval we have guilt when we are looking at self-respect like we have guilt all the time of saying oh I, I didn't do that right I need to go back and fix that so our emotions that we have are very normal very much a part of life and getting to our students to realize that is a huge component of our day. So I'm a principal at a K through five elementary school. Um, so all of our strategies are really focusing on teaching kids the basics at an entry level. So kids come in kindergarten, they're five years old, and they know they have emotions, but what they're trying to do is to figure out what to do with them. And so we really start from day one, focusing on how all emotions are okay, but just how we respond to our emotions is what makes a big difference. Uh, we are a, we call it E plus R equals O, that we have lots of events in our day and we get to choose our response. So it could be an above the line response or a below the line response and that predicts our outcome. Uh, so we make sure that it's okay to be angry. We say that to our, our kids all the way kindergarten and through fifth grade. We say it's okay to be angry. It's just how that we share that or how we express that is what we need to teach all of our students. So we have some students who can be really unregulated and have a hard time um, adjusting to, to figuring out how they feel with those emotions. Um, those are the kids you can tell them right away. Um, you know, they look agitated, they have those tightened fists, you know, their shoulders are, list, are lifted and they have like these furled eyebrows. I've also seen them throwing items or kicking things. You can hear them say like yelling. Um, they might have a sarcastic tone. They're disrespectful when you ask them a small task to do. Um, they might yell out no. Um, they might you know, to say, I don't have to follow anything that you say, and they're really unwilling to move. Um, an unregulated child thinks that they um, are the only ones like this, and that they have all these thoughts up in their head, but they can't verbalize them. They can't get them out. They feel like everyone is against them, and they're really struggling to control their own emotions. So an unregulated student is one um, that you might find out in the hallway, that you might find in the classroom corner, you might find them underneath the desk, you might find them, we have coat racks, you might find them underneath our coats. Uh, they're the ones that may step back from the other kids as well. Uh, some kids are really unregulated and they, they flip their lid and we teach the kids that term, like I'm, gonna, I'm ready to flip my lid and I need some strategies to calm down. Um, and then some kids, they can't do that calm down and they, they are already there, um, already in that unregulated state. So where my PowerPoint comes from today and what my focus is, is what do you do when you have that unregulated student? When you have that kiddo that has tried all of those things to not, be unregulated or not to be angry and um, they really just don't have the um, tools in their toolbox to calm themselves down so the first strategy that we use is distract 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 and that to me is really meeting the child where they're at 
And in um, emotional poverty, we have to figure out what skills our students are missing. And it, we have to be able to say, oh, it's okay, you know, you're missing this skill, but I have to be able to meet you where they're at. I can't expect a, to have it up here and expect the child to do behaviors when they're unregulated that they haven't even done beforehand. So my first goal is always distract, distract, distract. I am scanning their t-shirts. T-shirts to me are a huge go-to of what the child is interested in. So I always look at a t-shirt. So it could be a superhero t-shirt. It could be a cartoon t-shirt. It could be a sports t-shirt. Anything that I can see as what I'm looking for that day so that I can ask that first question of, do you really like superheroes? You have a superhero shirt on. I think you might be Superman today. Because when they're headed this way and they're headed towards that unregulated state, they don't have the skills to bring themselves down. I have to take that unregulated child that's headed this way and I have to move them this way. So in order to do that, I'll ask them questions that have nothing to do with the behavior that they um, find themselves in. I'll ask them what their favorite candy is. Um, I'll ask them why they like that type of candy. I also share with them my favorite type of candy. Um, if it's Halloween, it's perfect time because I'll always ask the person what they're going to be for trick or treat. Because trick or treat seems to get every kid like their mind shifted somewhere else. So trick or treat is a good one. I'll even ask it a couple months. I feel like I've got like a month or two leeway on it if it's coming up. So if it's September, I'm still like, hey, have you thought about what you're going to be for trick or treat? And it's usually it's the kids asking or talking about that. Um, or if it's a couple months after even, like in November, I've said, oh, did you get to go trick or treating this year? You know, what did you get? What was your favorite type of candy? That always seems to bring them around, just like that T-shirt, trying to get those conversations to move their mind thinking this way always helps. Another one I ask is their favorite cartoon or favorite TV show. Uh, I'll ask them if they've seen the latest Disney movie. Um, that seems to really bring them down too. I have also said, hey, I'm gonna print off a coloring page. Would you like a coloring page of Anna so that you can sit in my office and color it? I'll usually use that as a way to distract because I know that when I see their shoulders start going down, and they're able to talk to me about these things that it really um, brings the kid back to where we're able to process a few more things. Um, so I find that distracting is a very good strategy, especially, especially if they're in a classroom and I need to get them somewhere else. You know, the very last resort is, is wanting to move a child. I always want to get them to walk on their own. And so I use these strategies to get them to walk on my own. Um, I love the coloring page one because then I'm able to say to the student, well, in order for me to do that, in order for me to print off a coloring page for you, you've got to come to my office. So we've got to head down that way for me to print off that coloring page. And then that gets them moving. I usually can do the same thing with a t-shirt if they're a superhero. Can you show me how Superman flies or how does Spider-Man get down the hallway with his webs? Um, I'll ask, you know, can we be like Flash today and get down the hallway? Or I might relate it to a character of like, well, we're going to um, walk down like Goofy or we're going to be like Eeyore today. Whatever their character is, I'm going to meet them where they're at. And that way I have found that that brings their brain ready to be ready to be in that that state of thinking. And it also helps them to move across the hallway so that we don't have a big scene because I don't want to have a big scene and embarrass the child. And I don't want to come in with a power struggle. I, so I never come into a situation and say, hey, you, you got to move right now. Nope. I always get down on their level and ask them, you know, some of these questions, what their t-shirt, why they like that t-shirt, why they like that cartoon, what their favorite type of candy is. The second strategy I love is sensory boxes. And I love having sensory boxes in the classroom. The reason why I love sensory boxes in the classroom is it keeps the kid in their same comfortable area and they aren't leaving all of their friends, they aren't leaving all of their students, they don't feel excluded from everything. Plus they're also listening still to that instruction the teacher has. 
So I love having sensory boxes. We have created at our school, um, we just have a Rubbermaid tub and in there uh, we have cotton balls and we have an empty Kleenex box and they put the cotton balls in the Kleenex box or they take the cotton balls out of the Kleenex, bo Kleenex box. Um, we have magnetic sand. We'll do a lot of that sticky putty. Um, we've done, um, I think it's Aaron's thinking putty is what goes in our boxes. We'll have a glitter bottle. Now with a glitter bottle, that's a water bottle that has glitter put in it with some glycerin and we glue, hot glue the lid shut um, because that water bottle is gonna be turned upside down quite a lot and the kids can watch the glitter you know, like fall down and it just sits and relaxes them. We also will have stuffed animals and I love the weighted stuffed animals that have come out because they have a little bit of weight to them. So that helps the sensory mode of the students. It helps get them their, um, that pressure that they might need. There's also been um, stuffed animals that have the sequence that is one color and then you go the other way and it's a different color. The kids love the stuffed animals. I will tell you this, they're a little bit harder to keep clean. So you do need to spray those down with Lysol, um, sometimes every day if, it, if your sensory box is used well. But the kids love the stuffed animals. We also use the wiki sticks, which are those like sticky plastic or wax encased pieces of yarn. Um, and they can wrap them around. Um, they can design them and it's like a hold a shape well. Uh, I have a teacher that puts uh, put in 3D metal brain teasers in her box. And so you'll have to take the item and try to get the nail out. You know, you have to line the two things up right and get the nail out. Those are those old games that you would see. Uh, they have a lot of them at Cracker Barrel. But if you find them on Amazon with the 3D metal brain teasers, though, you'll you'll get exactly what um, we have put in our sensory boxes. Some teachers have also done their own tubs of rice or beans and put little um, animals in there and the kids have to sort them out. We also have gotten like big tweezers so the kids are working uh, on their fine motor as well and have to pick out each of the um, animals out of the beans or the rice. I will say on the rice, it can get a little messy so you wanna make sure to train your students beforehand on keeping the rice all in that Rubbermaid container, um, or you might have rice just everywhere. So thinking about that, training the students. We, from day one, when the students come into the classroom, or when you implement this, we have um, places, we have all of the items gone through. So the teacher will go through each item and talk about when you could use this and how this might help calm you down. We have the teacher show the students where it's located in their room. There's usually some sort of specialized seating and lighting right by them too. Uh, we'll do a um, scoop chair or a like an egg chair from Ikea where the there's a shade that goes down and that's really good. Um, what we have found is the sensory boxes are used so much. Um, every student knows when they need to go over there and they are able to self-regulate when they need to go over there and when they're done. Um, they also have realized that they get to stay in the classroom and are still learning. Our teachers have come back and said, oh, he's, he's able to participate from the class with the class over in his sensory corner. They still do it. So they know what the lesson is and every once in a while a student that's, that's using the sensory box will, will call out the answer. And that's when you know that you can start seeing them regulate down. So we have to give kids a lot of different strategies of what will work. And these are just items to include. One of the things um, that our students really love and it looks kind of like a baby toy, but it is, um, it's this, it's that bendable figure. I kind of call, well, I called it a baby chew toy, but it's not really a chew toy. It just bends and they can keep bending it and turning it. And it just gives them a great fidget tool. They can use this under their desk. They can take it back to their seat with them. Um, I love fidget balls. You just have to be careful a few times with those because sometimes those go flying across the classroom. So that's why we've tried to like find things that aren't necessarily um, 
like foam balls because we don't want those flying across the class. The other thing that we love to do is you get Velcro and you get, um, get already adhesive Velcro and you cut a long sheet about the width of the student's desk and you, you take off the adhesive backing and you'll place it underneath their desk so that they can just rub along the prickly side and the soft side. They can choose which sensory item they like the best. That is 100% in their seat. No one knows that they're using it. And that can be a strategy that you just set up between you and the student. So every year of school, I buy a big box of adhesive Velcro. And that's what we'll just put that under some kids' seats so that they have that right when they need it. And that's a great tool. Um, doesn't make them feel like they're secluded or all alone. It makes them feel like they're just doing exactly what they needed to do, but they're getting that sensory input when they need it. So the sensory boxes in the classroom have been a huge success, huge success. And the teachers love, love them. I also, at the end of the year, will offer the teachers, like, what else do you need for your sensory box? Uh, we do our ordering at the end of the year and we'll have the teachers um, put things in their carts that they'll say, I want to keep growing my sensory area uh, or I want it. I want to, I need another box. I have two kids at the same time. So those sensory boxes have been a great tool for teachers. Um, my third tip is to complete a chore. So I love this one because this is when the teacher catches the student um, before they start progressing this way. And they'll call them over and be like, hey, come here for a minute. And we keep all of our old dictionaries. We've kept um, some of them in our building. And what we'll do is the teachers will say, hand two dictionaries to the student and say, hey, can you take these down to the media center for me? I really need these. I really need to get these down to the media center. And um, Mrs. Arnold, our media center specialist is there and she needs these dictionaries. Do you think you can help me out? And the kids will always be like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this chore for you. I'm gonna do this task. It makes them a little helper. And they feel, they feel like they're really helping you out. And then the best part about it is, so we'll send the student down with the dictionaries and they'll take them down to Mrs. Arnold. And then you can see if a little bit later during the day, you know, they're starting to head this direction. You know, you can catch them going this way. You can catch them and take their mind this way and say, you know what? You know those dictionaries that you took down to Mrs. Arnold's class? I need you to go get those. Could you get those for me? And you have a little communication with Mrs. Arnold to let her know that you have a student that's doing a chore for you. Um, so Mrs. Arnold, who is our media center a specialist, can just you know check in and say oh thank you for doing those taking those dictionaries down I needed that that was a big task I appreciate it um, we also have teachers send notes to each other and the note may just say like hello I am thinking of you today um, and send it to another teacher or we have them take down the attendance passes or the tardy passes any sort of a chore that it might you might the student might just need a little change of scenery this is a great thing. And if they think that they're helping you out, they really truly feel like they're going on an adventure. Um, kids love feeling like that they're special and that we've picked them to do a special task. And so getting their mind focused on something else is a great way, a great strategy. And this one's like free. I know the sensory boxes, you might be buying some items. This one, we all have those books in our library that are old. You just need to make sure the books have a little bit of weight to them, which is why we kept our dictionaries, because they're a little bit heavier. It gives them that sensory input um, as they're carrying them. So that's why we've chosen dictionaries. You can have them take a task or take a note if they just need a break from the classroom. But if, they, if you feel like they need that sensory input, then having those dictionaries is a great resource. Uh, we've tried some thinner books and those are those are fine. Like I said, if you just need a chore, but it's not giving them that input that they that they need throughout their body um, through their muscle structure. So old dictionaries, don't throw them out. Make sure you keep some of them and keep them in your class because they're a great strategy. The next tip is tip number four. And I love this one. Um, when you have an unregulated student sit next to them versus across the table from them. When you sit across the table, it kind of has that me versus you feeling like in that very accusatory feeling. 
Um, it has a, it doesn't flow conversation very well. It's one of those puts kids on the spot. So I always, always sit next to a child that communicates that I'm on your side. Um, if they're crouched down on the floor, I'm gonna crouch down on the floor right next to them. Not across from them, but right next to them. Um, I love it when they're usually sitting in the hallway because I can just go and sit in the hallway and I try to mimic what their posture is too. So if their legs are out into the hallway, I might just have my legs out into the hallway too. Um, I will say if a student is like flat on their stomach, I don't, I don't necessarily get flat on my stomach, although that would kind of be funny. Um, I'm sure my teachers would get a kick out of that, but I try to um, just go next to them. And I also lower my voice. So I have a principal's voice, as everybody calls it, and I can project really loud. But when I'm working with a student that's unregulated, I try to just make sure that my voice is calmer and that I'm talking slower and that I do a lot more listening than I do um, information giving because I wanna listen to what they're saying. Because sometimes, particularly if they are on their floor, their mouths are muddled or, and I have to figure out what they're trying to say. So I wanna make sure that I'm calm, that I myself am regulated, that I have a slower vo voice, lower tone, and that I'm really listening to them because they're gonna feel then that, they're, that we're all on the same side and that's when you're gonna see them start opening up to you. And there have been times that I'll have said, I just, I can't hear what you're saying. I'm so sorry, I'm trying so hard to hear what you're saying, but if you could sit up, that would really help Mrs. Slowed out. And that's, I'm getting old. I can't hear very well anymore. Can you help me out and sit up? And then you'll start, start to see them slowly move up. And you just wait and you pause and you and you watch them slowly um, start to talk to you. And that's when I know when we're sitting side by side that we can handle this situation together. And it gives the student that feeling that we're handling this situation together, that this just isn't their problem, that they just weren't secluded for something, but that we're here together to work on this, that I'm here to help. That's what I wanna to communicate to all of my students. So really making sure that you watch where you sit and I never tower over somebody. Um, I never like I target down. I'm always meet, re, meet, meeting the student where they're at, trying to reach them where they're at. All right, tip number five. I love doodling. Um, I think that whenever you can get a kid um, working on something that's going on in their brain. They might be drawing something or trying to communicate something to you in pictures. Doodling matters. It matters in helping concentration. I never, I never get upset when people are doodling while I'm presenting because to me that's the, that is them thinking. So if you're doodling right now at home, that's great. I, I encourage that because that means that you're aiding the concentration and helping your brain organize everything that's going on. So when I see a student doodling, I see them starting to zero in on what's going on. And this is when they're, um, this is when I've gotten them down into my office. I'll usually say, hey, let's go and get a piece of paper and we can go and draw something or we can start thinking about something. And this is when I have already gotten them calmed. I see teachers do this a lot in the hallway. Um, in our hallways, we've created a like sensory area, just it could be a rocking chair with a little table next to it. And there's some paper and crayons out for students. And if once they start doodling, I know that their mind is starting to refocus, that they're starting to tame that unregulated brain and they're able to make connections. They're gonna be able to um, visualize their ideas and they're gonna be able to start communicating what's really going on. You can tell a lot from pictures. I've always been able to tell a lot from pictures. I can tell um, from their writing and their pictures that they've drawn with their writing, um, maybe who's do who doesn't feel safe at home. I've able to, I'm able to see who doesn't feel safe at school or who feels upset with um, maybe a friend in their classroom. When I get, I, I have found that this is very successful with my fourth and fifth grade girls, particularly when they're um, very upset 
when another friend has was hurt their feelings and they're starting to be really unregulated, their their lids ready to flip. Um, I've found that doodling is a great way to really draw out how they're feeling. And I, nobody needs to be drawing like Picasso art over here. We're just talking about even just lines, squiggle lines, um, just those lines to start calming yourself down. Those are perfect. And that's when I know that I'm going to start seeing a student that's able to talk. I love the, um, I love when they're doodling because they're also able to look somewhere else and they're um, really thinking about what's going on inside and that that helps. So this is one that's kind of more after you get them somewhere that I have found this this technique is really good to get an idea of what's going on in their brain. And I'll always ask them like, oh, what are you doodling over there? That looks so good. I'll ask if they want more colors. Do they want markers? Do they want pencils? Do they want pens? My younger students love doodling with pen because they don't get to use pen in the classroom. But I want to have something that's going to also have, I love pen and paper because it's got that sensory input to them. So when they're when they're using their pens, they're getting that sensory input into their arms as well. So asking the students what type of medium they want to use to doodle with always helps. Uh, I love it too because not everybody gets to use markers sometimes and the markers just really like the kids are like I get to use markers and I'll be like oh I only let you know only today can you use markers because it's special today like you you are special right now so I'm gonna let you use these markers to doodle and that just seems to really really build that bridge where it always where that, where that student is just feeling like yeah I, you are on my side and this is where it gets them to starting to talk and that's the ultimate goal because I want students to talk because I need to know where their gaps are in their in their emotional regulation and in that emotional poverty because as ruby has said in that book that's where it's really really what we need to figure out is what skills they're lacking and how we're going to teach them those skills all right tip number six give them time okay this one can be a challenge for me sometimes i'm going to admit this is the one that i struggle with the most because being a principal i usually have People standing at my doorway wanting to ask me a question. I have phone conversations. I'll have email I have to check. Like there's a lot of things going on. It's recess duty, it's lunch duty. This teacher um, had to leave early because her child's sick. So there's a lot of things that, that go on a principal's plate, just like a teacher. Like their schedules are so packed that if something happens at recess, you wanna get it solved quickly because you got a lesson to teach. Like, I get it. You got to go and teach that lesson. But the thing is, some kids just need more time. They need more time to process what's going on. They need more time to think about what really happened. And I was looking um, in the Emotional Poverty book. Ruby does a great job at listing females and males and explains uh, that females love to talk about their emotions with detail. And you'll see this as girls get upset with each other that they that they all becoming, they might come to me crying or very peaked, heightened about because somebody um, said something to them and they need to describe everything that they're feeling, everything that that child was wearing at that, that, that time, the classroom they were in, what the teacher was saying, like it just, you can get all of the details. Whereas males find it very difficult to explain their emotions. I have lots of times, um, I have students in my office, particularly, maybe something's usually gone wrong at recess basketball or at recess soccer, and boys will be in my room and they'll just kind of be sitting there and then all of a sudden you'll see just a tear rolling down their cheek. And how do you draw that emotion out? Like how do you draw what's going on inside of their head out. And truly what I have found is that it takes time and I have to be patient. I have to be the one that's listening. I have to be the one that's there ready to ask them questions. I also already have to have a relationship built with them that they have to know that they can trust me. Um, females focus on faces and things. So females are very much reading my expression. I have a 16 year old daughter at home and she is always scanning my face for my expression of if I approve or not. So I know with females, they're always 
scanning my nonverbals to make sure what they can get from me emotionally. Um, so, so those, those are the ones I have to watch and make sure I have my game face on that. I don't have that, you know, that angry accusatory face on, but I have that, that feeling of camaraderie that I'm here on your side. Let's work through this together. Boys, I have noticed the best thing to do is to get out that sensory tub. I have a sensory tub in my office. I have a Rubik's cube in it. Um, I also have a bouncy ball because boys, learn up to 10 times better with movement and when they get that rhythm of the bouncy ball then they'll start realize they'll start to calm down they'll start to um like will lower their heart rate and be ready to talk uh, females want face-to-face -face conversation and they want to be smiled at they want your approval to know that you're um that you're listening and you're there males want to avoid all eye contact. I never say to a male student, look me in the eye. I actually don't say that to any student because that makes it very, um, very much me versus them person or they're more in trouble because we usually say that, you know, look me in the eye when they're in trouble. So I don't have students do that. Um, that's very much an adult thing. That's not necessarily a compliance thing for a child. So I will not say to them, look me in the eye. I'll just go next to them. They prefer, males is particularly prefer that you sit beside them. So I will, um, I'll say to them, if they, if, they made a, if they made a poor choice or a below the line choice, you know, I'll sit next to them and, and they'll be sitting here and I'll be like, man, that's a bummer of a choice today, huh? And they'll, and they'll say, yeah, yeah, this is where I went wrong. I'm like, that, you know, how can we get better next time? Now, I will say this takes time to get here. Males, it can take them up to five hours to process an emotional question, whereas girls are ready to get it all out. They're ready to get it all out quickly, but boys need that time. And this is where I said, this is where it gets hard because we're all so busy in the day. We have so many places to be. We have so many things we have to get done. We have our lesson plans all figured out. We have everything on our list that we need to check off. Not never in there does it say, oh, I have to give Tommy five hours of time so that he can calm down and process the recess issue. No, we have to really, really embed that in, which also goes back to that sensory box. Can I can can you give time with that sensory box and I'm going to give you a half an hour and then come back and talk. Keep building those things into your day naturally so that you have those go to strategies when they need that time. So a sensory box is great. Sending them on a chore, those types of things so that they can get their um, emotions thought out and what they wanna say. All right, tip number seven is drink water. This one was such an easy tip and such a change, um, a change agent at, at our school. Um, water helps metabolize cortisol and cortisol is what we build up when we get when we get angry. So when they go get a drink of water and give that, you know, you watch it, give it time, a little bit of time. Not you don't need five hours like the last one. But if you give it some time, you'll see that the students start start focusing on the water. You can see that they're metabolizing that cortisol. You can watch when their shoulders relax. That's always a big that big notice for me, I'll look at their eyebrows and I look at their shoulders and I can see kind of where they are at on that, that emotional level of are they headed up? Are they ramping back down? Where are they? But drinking water, we have um, water, biller, water, water bottle filler stations around our school. Uh, we encourage everybody to bring a water bottle with them. And when I'm walking with them or when I uh, when they're down here in the office or if I'm in the classroom with them, I'll always be like, where's your water, where's your water bottle at? Hey, let's let's go get that. Oh, my goodness. It needs some more water in here, doesn't it? Let's walk down and get some water. We're going to take some sips of water and, and we're going to we're going to we're going to relax for a minute. Always approaching it like that makes that student know that um, I'm on their side. And then I'm listening to what they're saying and drinking water also it changes their location and drinking water helps break down that cortisol. So there's like three strategies right there when I meet them where they're at and and try to change their thinking from going here to going this way or getting them to calm back down by taking them to go 
fill up their water bottle and then watching them drink the water. I encourage them to drink water. If they're in my office and they don't have a water bottle with them, I keep lots of water bottles um, here at school. I also have cups because I know that that can get expensive. I do have cups. Um, funny story is our nurse's office has cups too. And I'm like, oh, I'll just use those nurse's office cups. Well, they're like ice cream cone holders and they have that cylinder bottom. And I was like, well, that's not gonna work because they can't put the cup down on the table. So I went out and bought some cups the next day and I'm able to fill it up. We have our nurse's station is close by and we also have our uh, lounge kitchen that is close by. If the student is able to, I make sure that they come with me. If they're able to go to the nurse's station and fill up there, then they're more than welcome to do that. If, But I always have to kind of measure where they're at on that emotional line if they're if they're how far their their lid is flipped or if they're ready to calm back down so filling up water bottles are great having the kids drink water but tip for me make sure they're not ice cream cone shaped cups that one i learned all right tip number eight a sensory room and sensory walk so i have pictures up here of our sensory room and in our sensory room, they're a little bit different than our sensory boxes that the, that the teachers have in their room um, because it's an actual place where they can leave. So we have a sensory room in our school. It's actually our guidance counselor's office. It's kind of half guidance counselor, half sensory room. But when they walk in, there's a visual timer. And that visual timer is where they move the dial and there's um, like this red transparency they set their time, so it might go to 15 minutes and then there's a big red chunk of where they can see their time shrinking down. So I, my first question always to them is with a, when they come into the sensory room, like how much time do you think you need? And I let the kids decide how much time they feel like they need. Um, and that sets, their, that sets the time that they're gonna be in there. I also say, okay, you're gonna pick an activity. Um, in our sensory room, we have magnet tiles, and that is what this student is working on here. You can see um, these are magnet tiles, so they're magnetic plastic pieces that you can build with. We have more putty. Uh, the lighting is always low in there. We So we have lots of lamps. We also have music. We have a CD player that has uh, some sort of spa CD and it's just on repeat. So it's constantly playing the same 10 songs throughout the day. We have beanbag chairs the kids can sit in, scoop chairs. We also have a tent with pillows inside the tent. And that is that has been really beneficial for those kids that are so overloaded. They can, there is so much going on that they just need to take a break and shut everything out. The tent has been really good. Uh, we do have our sensory rooms staffed, so there's always somebody in there. So like I said, our guidance counselor will be in there. Um, we have had some of our as a classroom assistants come and take time and spend in there as well. So there's always somebody in there. I will go in and sit and monitor the sensory room uh, just because we wanna make sure everybody's safe. Not that there's anything in there that would cause major harm, but just wanted to make sure if, if students are headed this way that they're not um, finding all of these things that, too, that overwhelm them too much. So our tent is a really good place, particularly for those kids that just need, like they need that whole sensory break. We also have Legos in there. This is a great place for, we do have some rice and we have a bean tray in there. We'll have them draw in sand. Uh, the students can also choose to pick things up out of putty. They like doing that. We have, this is where we have our weighted blankets and weighted vests. We have moved some of those to the classroom. However, not everybody feels comfortable using a weighted blanket or weighted vest in their classroom. And when they leave the sensory room, we always have them leaving with a breathing routine. So the, the breathing routine is smell the flowers and blow out the candle. And we'll have the student place uh, their finger in front of them. And we'll say, okay, here's a flower, smell the flower, and they need to breathe in. And then blow out the candles. So the students are able to feel their own breath. And I'll say, did you breathe deep enough? Did you feel your own breath when you were breathing in or breathing out the candle? 
And that works really well for um, our students to give them that breathing routine. And we have them do it a couple of times a day. So we'll say, breathe in, smell the flowers, blow out the candles. And you have to make sure that they can feel their breath on their finger because that's how you know they're getting enough air out. So they do that three times before they leave the sensory room. We also have them doing that in the classroom. Breathing techniques are another technique that my teachers teach the students. Um, Sesame Street has a great belly breathing video by Elmo. So our younger kids can use that. We've also implemented yoga techniques and the breathing techniques that are some of our yoga teachers or our teachers that have their yoga teaching license have instructed the kids on as well. A sensory, a sensory walk has been great for our school. Um, this one we've set up ourselves, so it's very cheap. Um, you can see with this picture here, my student Ibrahim is, um, he's got the Velcro. So that's, that is the soft side and the prickly side of Velcro. And they just put their arms against the wall and they do these wall push-ups. We have them do 10 wall push-ups. We'll have them do 10 crab walks. So you can see crab walk forward, crab walk backwards. Um, this one is a line jump. So we just took a piece of yellow electrical tape, put it down on the line, put it down on the linoleum, and they just jump from one side to another. And they do that 10 times. We have them do cross crawls. Well, they'll take their right arm and they'll tap their left knee and they'll take their left arm and tap their right knee. So they're crossing midline. We have pictures of all of these things. So I take pictures of the students actually doing the sensory walk so they see themselves as doing it. We have sensory walk passes in our classroom. So it's, and it's just a piece of green construction paper that's laminated and it says sensory walk on it so that we know. They also um, take yarn and put it around their neck so that everybody knows that they're going on a sensory walk. And we have it in the middle. We have a foyer in our um, school. So we have this in the middle of our foyer so everybody can kind of see what they're doing. And we've created up to 10 different stations based on some of the needs of the kids. They don't have to do all 10. They can do five, they can do six, they can do two. It just depends. We also have that elastic stretch band, um, that Pilates yoga type stretch band stuff. We can get it at um, Walmart. We've ordered off of Amazon and it, they're going to stretch out. So they'll stretch out their arms and they'll stretch them back in. And they do a great job um, with the stretch band and it gives them more sensory input. There have been recently companies that you can buy things that make it a sensory walk. Those are a little bit more expensive. You are certainly able to put that down. Talk to your custodian because they're able to like layer wax over the top of it. And that helps uh, keep it clean and keep it nice for multiple years. We have not purchased one of those yet because we've made up our own and the students know it by now. The other things that we have done is change the stations because they might be tired of crab walking. Like we may have had that out for a couple of months and it's time now to do something different. So we change our stations often so that the students have something new to go through. A teacher trains them once on how to do this so that they know how to properly use all of the equipment. And we don't let students use it that aren't wearing the sensory pass. So all of the teachers have two sensory passes in their classroom and that gives them, if, the, if that's what the child needs, it's another time that they're um, taking a break and they're going down and doing the sensory walk. So a sensory walk is for students that just need that little bit of break and then can head right back. A sensory room visit, might be somebody that might even need to talk to somebody while they're there, might be a child that, that really is headed to ramp up and has a sensory break, sensory room break. We've scheduled times during the day, like we can tell some kids need it right after recess. Um, after recess throughout the whole building, we do a, we listen to, we call mindful music moments where we all listen to a piece of classical music and take that breather right after recess because everybody needs that five minute reset your mind. And we'd like to do those breathing techniques. A lot of, a lot of teachers will also do um, Go Noodle, which is free. And, and you can Google classical music on YouTube and play it in your room. But Go Noodle has some breathing, some calm down breathing techniques, and that's free as well. 
So just really figuring out what the temperature is of each student. That's where those relationships come in very handy so that you know each kid and know what each kid needs. You know, looking at who needs the sensory walk versus who needs the sensory room versus who can do a sensory box in my classroom. And here's the other thing I would tell you too. Don't do all of this at once. Like start with a sensory box because it keeps them in the classroom. And then if they need a little bit more, then move to the sensory walk. And then if that's not working, give it a couple of weeks. Don't, don't just give it one day. Don't just give it, you know, a couple of hours. Give it some time to see, is that what's working? Then add in that, then maybe they need the sensory room uh, where they can be a little bit more um, free to take those breaks as they need it to. So that's where it comes in, like I said, comes in handy listening to the student. All right, this strategy, I never ever thought of this before until I had gone to Ruby's uh, conference. I got to see her in person and I never thought of this strategy. And the teachers and I were talking about it and what a game changer this one has truly been. So the strategy is look up and it is in the emotional poverty book. It's, it's like in the first chapter. And this one, by far, has probably been my favorite um, because just of how far every teacher has taken it. So, so look up. When students look up, they're not able to be internalizing their emotions. When they start looking up, they look outside of their body. They look outside of themselves. They look outside of their emotions and are able to think about calming down. When they're down like this, they're going internal. When I know that I have somebody down in here, I know I need to get them to look up. So what I have done is taken garage sale stickers, just the dots. They don't have the price tag on it, but just those dots. And I have placed them on our ceiling. You can see with our ceilings, we have these um, little rails. Those are metal rails. And I have placed a, a placed a sticker right on one of those metal rails. And all I have to do is when a student is upset and I'll have, I just go, huh, I never noticed this before. I just noticed a blue sticker on our ceiling. Why do you think that's there? And then the student, I know I've got them when they're like, oh, when they start looking up and I'll be like, oh my goodness, guess what? I see a red one over there. And I am modeling the behavior that I want. I myself am looking up. I'll even notice that my chin is pointed up. And I'll say, oh my goodness, looking up, I see those stickers. I see a yellow one. Let's go see. How many more do you find? And that usually is when I start talking again, is when I, when I know that when they start looking at those stickers and they start counting them, they can look for different colors. I have garage sale circle stickers. I've also found these um, about the same size. They're stars. And this just like, this just keep, kept evolving uh, as it went. So we started with stickers and then I had a teacher, you can look at the photos collage. I had a teacher who had a student um, that was just having a really hard time regulating and she loves bunnies. She loves rabbits, she loves bunnies. This is a fourth grader and she would be um, outside in a little calm down area, out, just right out the door and a teacher put bunnies just pictures of bunnies on our ceiling and so you know they it was great because the student was you know creating own stories of these bunnies like which bunny do you like the best what where do you think this bunny is right now how did this bunny get there does this bunny have a family this photo collage was fantastic we've done this with spongebob we've done it with pokemon We've now done it with um, cartoon characters. So these photo collages have been great. That was a huge game changer. And what was awesome is the teacher came up with that all on her own. And with such success that we've had with the stickers and the photo collage, we decided to do a, what I call a um, ceiling sensory walk. So we, spent this summer we took a uh, we call it a staff retreat day and the staff spent time painting ceiling tiles and i got permission from the school district to do it but we painted ceiling tiles and some say spread kindness 
um, will have quotes from books that they've read on there. Wonder, you know, if you had the, cho the choice between right and kind, or yeah, right and kind, choose kind. We have um, ladybugs on there. We'll have desserts on there. We have the sun, moon, and stars on another one. And the kids go around and they can look at these things. Uh, we've created a um, seek and find with them because there's hidden pictures in some of them. We'll have one that is a cupcake and they'll say, what type of cupcake do you like? So we've created this online sensory, or not online, um, ceiling sensory walk and the students have really appreciated it it's really calmed them down because i'll be able to say have you read that tile lately and they'll get right underneath it as you can see from my picture down here my little guy is looking up at the tiles and he's counting how many rocket ships he sees how many planets he sees how many stars he sees so that has been a great strategy um, because it's getting them to look up and looking up has made a huge, huge difference within our whole school. All right, number 10, this is, this is the big one, is equipping the teachers. So I'm a principal and I wanna make sure that my teachers have these strategies. People are uh, teachers themselves. You need to make sure that you have these strategies. We read Ruby's book, we did a book talk on it, and the teachers really got to dig deep in topics that were interesting to them. Uh, we, you know, we learned a lot about ACES scores and we learned a lot about attachment and bonding. And um, if they didn't have all of the attachment stages done right or, or met at the right time, that they might be stuck back in an infant or a toddler attachment and bonding stage. And uh, teachers were really benefited really thankful for that information because they realized, oh, I can't expect the student to act like a eight or nine year old because their attachment and bonding stage, their adjustment stages are only at that of a toddler. So they're gonna only react in ways that a toddler might react. That was a huge game changer for a lot of the teachers here because it helped them realize different ways they needed to approach the students. That when we're expecting right here, but their skills are here, We've got to figure out, we've got to, we've got to come down and figure out how to teach them so that they can, they can rise up to it. We did um, professional learning communities with these. We have um, also worked on some district-wide PD for making sure that the teachers feel like they have the strategies they need to implement in their classroom. We had one day where it was build your own sensory box. And it was a huge, it was in our media center and every station had something new at it that they would put in their box. So the teachers got time to actually use the sensory tool. They got time to build the sensory tool box. And then they were able then to discuss with kids what strategy or what tool might be best for them. Uh, I'm always all about feeding the teachers with strategies because if I don't realize that like if my teachers meet an unregulated child and they themselves are unregulated. Now I have two people with unregulated, unintegrated brain responses and nobody's getting anywhere. I love that quote from Ruby Payne's book on page 17 about you've got to come in when you have an unregulated child, you have to come in with a calm. And we encourage relationship building. So we use a tap in, tap out strategy because if, if I find myself you know, with an unregulated child starting to head to the, where I'm unregulated, I might say to somebody, I need to tap out. And I have a counselor that can come in or another teacher that can come in and they take it from there. What I've also found too, is that if I consistently take the kids out, I'm getting the relationship building when, when the calm down happens, because the calm down is that priceless time when you can really generate strategies and that's when you can help grow their own their students toolboxes so if i'm the one that's always in the calm down time and giving them strategies that's not building relationships with the teachers so what we do is we might say i'm going to tap in and i tap in and cover the class so that the teacher can tap out and work with the student so 
we'll say things like, hey, I need, a, I need a break, I need to tap out. If a teacher finds themselves getting unregulated, we'll say, I need a break, I need to tap out, and I'll come in and, and work with the student. We'll also say that, that I'm gonna tap into the classroom so that the teacher can then, can then have those strategies where they work with the student. So we have it made, we have it, we have that system down really well. Um, teachers just text me like, I need you to tap in so I can work with Johnny. And so I will go down to the classroom or I get a text to like, I need, I need to tap out of this situation. If Susie's really um, upset and I need a break and that's okay. I want my teachers to know it's okay to say, I need to tap out. There are times that I'm working with a student and I can tell that I am setting them off, that I am the one that is causing it so that they can't unregulate. It could just be, it could just be my presence. It could be that my hair is dark brown. I don't know. It could just be something that, that me being around causes them to not calm down. And so I have had to say like, listen, this student can't calm down right now because I'm here. I'm going to give them some space, but can you stand in the doorway and, and watch them for me? Or can you just help see if you can go in there and talk to them and have a different strategy? So we do that tap in, tap out all the time here. And it doesn't have to be me that taps in. Um, I have a, a literacy and math coach. The literacy and math coach has gone in and tapped in and taught the class so the teacher could walk out with the student um, and go get some calm down strategies. And sometimes it doesn't even, they don't even have to leave the classroom. Um, they can even, I can tap in and teach the classroom and the teacher can work in the back of the classroom with, with the student on getting them their calm down strategies. We have lots of people here that are able to do the tap in, tap out, um, but making sure the teachers know when they've hit their threshold of being an unintegrated, unregulated brain um, because that's really, that's, that's huge. Because if I go into a situation and I see that a student is up here and I see that a teacher is up here, it's okay. I just, they just need to take a break for a minute. And then I'm going to distract the student that way. Like I'll, I'm going to get their mind thinking about something else so that we can bring them down to talk about new strategies that we can implement. But we have to be careful that we don't get into power struggles and that we don't have our brains ourselves become unregulated because that's not going to solve anyone's problems. It's just going to create another unregulated brain in the classroom. So making sure the teachers are equipped. So teachers, if, if you're on here, making sure that you learn strategies and principles. If you're on here and district leaders, making sure that you give strategies to your teachers because there's a lot of social emotional needs there's a lot of trauma. There's a lot of things that our students need. And we didn't necessarily go to college to get a, a therapy degree. We went to get a teaching degree. And now we find ourselves being teachers and therapists. And how do we meet both of those needs? That's a lot. That's a lot for anybody to handle in a day. That's a lot for us to ask of our teachers. That's when, when they don't have that professional counseling training and the kids come in with such heavy needs. We need to make sure that they know the resources where to get counseling for the students that they can hand out to parents and we also know where they can get counseling um, for themselves because we don't want any secondary trauma to come upon our teachers without them working through it because a, a student can be going through such high trauma that the teacher may take it on themselves too like they may take their emotions in from that student and really hold it in their heart and that's that's unhealthy too so giving the teacher somebody to talk to as well uh, i've been thinking about the aces score the adverse childhood experiences uh, where you rate how how many adverse childhood experiences you have and that's a great reflection to go back to in our lives but what we're doing is we are helping our students as they're going through their aces so really being a listening ear um, knowing that we're not going to have all of the answers as teachers and as school staff, but being there as support, building that relationship, realizing why our students might be unregulated a lot of times, um, because there's a lot of other things going on, and being able to meet them where they're at. That's huge. We always want to make sure that students come first, um, that we take the time to listen, and that we um, just let them know that, that we're here for them. When they think that we're on their side, those students are going to flourish. 
because they want that relationship, they want that connection. So I've given you a lot of strategies, a lot of things to think about. I hope some of these are gonna be easily implementable into your classroom, into your school. Uh, feel free to email me anytime. I'm the principal at Hilliard Horizon Elementary School, and that's in Hilliard, Ohio. Uh, you can reach me through email at Hillary underscore sloat at hboe.org. Please note that there is only one L in my name. And I also have a Twitter account, and it is at Hillary Sloat, where I've posted some of these strategies and ideas that have worked, um, make, and, and letting everybody know what a great place Hilliard Horizon Elementary School is. So if you have any questions, absolutely reach out, ask them. I'm here to help. I am, I am, this is my passion. I love equipping teachers, equipping principals, and equipping build, buildings to meet the students where they're at to help them through the school day and help them when, they're, when their brain is unregulated to calm down, to build the skills, to make it a successful time next time. So enjoy your day and, and enjoy teaching because it's a great, it's a great opportunity to change a student's life. Have a great day.